Hey, it's Mistress Carrie, reporting for duty from MCHQ for episode 28 of the Mistress Carrie podcast. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Digital Federal Credit Union, better known as DCU. Every dollar counts, and DCU understands that. And they've got ways to help your money work harder for you. Wouldn't that be nice to have your money work for you? Like, if you love your car, but not your current auto loan. Refinancing with DCU could put you back in the driver's seat with a lower monthly payment. They offer the same low rates to their members for new and used vehicles. Find out what DCU could mean to you and your current auto loan when you refinance with them. Visit dcu.org slash auto refi to try their loan payment calculator and to see what your monthly auto payment could be. This episode of the podcast is also sponsored by MistressCarry.com. MistressCarry.com is now the center of the Mistress Carry universe, featuring all of the episodes of the Mistress Carry podcast and cocktails in the war room, plus an event and concert calendar, my official blog, photo galleries, and the Mistress Carry online store, where you can get hooked up with cocktails in the war room, t-shirts, and hoodies. Mistress Carry t-shirts, beanies, coffee mugs, pint glasses, stickers, and even Christmas ornaments. You can find the perfect gift for a transplanted New Englander or a diehard rock fan from Boston. Right on MistressCarry.com. And there's still time to order in time for the holidays. And to shop in the online store with a discount, get yourself a Mistress Carry backstage pass on Patreon. Just go to mistresscarry.com to find everything. And speaking of the Mistress Carry backstage passes, I want to thank Karina and Rico for picking up theirs this week. Okay, this week we caught up with Wes Scantlin from Puddle of Mud. The band released their first EP back in 1994, but most people got to know Puddle of Mud in 2001 when their full-length debut came out called Come Clean. Originally hailing from Kansas City, but now holed up in Los Angeles, Wes Scantlin is no stranger to controversy, and he talks a lot about it in this episode. He's also very forthcoming about his struggles with sobriety and offered some amazing stories touring with some of our favorite bands, and you even find out how to get kicked out of Graceland. Plus, you can't talk to somebody from Kansas City and not bring up barbecue. 2020 was supposed to be a huge year for Puddle of Mud. In September of 2019, the band released their album, Welcome to Galvania, and this year was supposed to be filled with touring on that album. However, we all know what happened with that. And because of the coronavirus, Wes Scantlin's been holed up in his house writing music. He's super easy to talk to and really open and honest and sometimes self-effacing. So allow me to introduce you to Wes Scantlin from Puddle of Mud. Hey, what's up? This is Sully from Godsmack. Strap on those boots, baby, because you are now in the trenches of the war room with the one and only Mistress Carrie right here on the Mistress Carrie podcast. What's up? This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. I have so lovely... Hey, this is Brent from Shinedown, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hey, Carrie, go put your brow on, girl. Hey, this is Steven Tyler, and you'll be listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. What's up? This is Aaron from Stain, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters, and you're listening to the one, the only, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is David from the band Disturbed, and you're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. This is Marilyn Manson, and you're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. Hi, this is Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. You're listening to Mistress Carrie. This is Dennis Leary. You are listening to my favorite, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is Corey from Stone Sour, and you're listening to... You have the privilege of listening to Mistress Carrie. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Hello? Yowza. What's going on? Just up and about... Good morning. I guess this is my morning. <laughs> Would you rather me call you Wes or Wesley? What do you prefer? I really don't care. Actually, you should call me Dorkwad or something. Okay, Dorkwad it is. Okay, good. I'm a little <laughs> dorky. I'm a geek. Or geek. I'm a geek. Are you really a geek? Are you that nerdy? I'm like a nerd. I'm a, I'm a nerd. T- 
Tell me like the top nerd thing that you do that qualifies you for that moniker. Um, the nerdiest thing that I do is probably just when I'm writing songs, um, you know, I get, I got to go through some goofiness to get to some cool, some cool parts <laughs> when I'm, when I'm writing. And I go up to the, these little candles that my uh, my friend and publicist uh, Barbara Papa Georgie she sent me, and I'll go up and I'll I'll smell these little awesome candles that she got me for like ones for inspiration and ones for positivity, and that's I guess kind of goofy and dorky I guess I don't know. They say that the sense of smell is very directly tied to memories. Gets into your brain. Yeah. But yeah she sent me these awesome candles and my sister sent me some, you know, I got a lot of cool people sending me a lot of cool, like just little cool little things, you know? Did you grow up doing nerdy stuff like comic books and, you know, computer stuff? I mean, you know, now all of that yeah. stuff is cool, but back then when we were kids, you got called a nerd for that. We were, um, me and my, my next door neighbor was like my best friend way back. Uh, we would do, we were doing like uh, he he was making like those masks like Halloween like masks you put over your head and stuff. Um, he was making like latex masks like like scary Halloween masks, and we were doing like like horror movies and stuff. And we were we were doing a, we did a lot of videotaping. It was kind of like uh like we had our own show. It was, it was almost like Jackass meets Bam, you know, Viva La Bam. You know, um, you know, we were even like like doing skateboarding downtown in Kansas City and videotaping stuff like that when we were like 15, 16. And then a lot of times we would just play like dock tag um, on the on the lake, you know, and I would just tread water in the middle of the cove and like go down to the bottom of the the, the cove and just kind of like sit there and like seriously, like just like gush around with this like black mud at the bottom of the cove and just like brah, and just like put it through your fingers and rub it on your face like we did all kinds of weird goofy crazy stuff did you grow up loving horror movies a lot of a lot of people in rock bands did i i actually had fun like doing like you know playing a part in one of bobby's movies like that he was directing um you know, like, um, you know, getting my, like a fake arm torn off of my, off of my body and then like squeezing this, this bulb that had like blood squirting out of my shoulder. Like, and we were, we were doing all kinds of this little goofy, creepy, little funny things. Oh, uh, the- just being, I don't know. <laughs> Over the years, I've noticed some trends with, with the musicians that I talk to. And it seems that, you know, musicians always want to either be actors and be in movies or they want to be athletes. And then when you talk to the athletes, they either want to be actors or they want to be rock stars. And then the actors always want to be rock stars or they envy the athletes. It's really funny that those three different jobs or different means of expression, I guess, always seem to feed into each other yeah i was i played soccer my whole life and um yeah i mean dude i could have i could have done some i could have actually seriously i was gonna get signed by a by a really big european football soccer team but uh i picked up the guitar a few years before that and uh i was like nah I'd rather do this because uh, I went to Van Halen 1984 jump tour when I was like 12. And I was like, I want to, I want to do that, you know? And um, Eddie Van Halen's gone, but I'll tell you what, he is never going to be forgotten and I love him and I miss him. And uh, I was super, super bummed out when he uh, passed, um, you know, and I'm I'm very happy that uh, about a few years ago I quit uh, I quit smoking. So hopefully, uh, hopefully it doesn't bite me in the butt later. 
but I'm feeling pretty good these days. When news broke that Eddie Van Halen had passed, obviously every musician, you know, was was just shell shocked. And when you go back and look at the number of bands and the number of musicians like yourself that were inspired to pick up the guitar or inspired to start writing music because of Van Halen, it's almost everybody. They, it's just that they're just a, it was just really just good, cool music, you know? It just really it was really cool, man. And Eddie Van Halen, like, I, I don't know how he played like that, but I guess he just got some gift from God, and God just said, here, you're going to be, like, the best guitar player ever. So, you know, he's probably up in heaven, you know, playing playing little little awesome songs for God, you know? And having, you know, massive shred offs with some of the other amazing guitar players that we've lost over the years. <laughs> I know. I mean, shoot, Prince was like freaking unbelievably amazing. Like just amazing songwriter in general. But I mean, just as far as a guitar player is concerned, I mean, that guy seriously, he was like right, right in that, like, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan, you know, he, that dude was amazing. That guy was insane as well. I don't know who's better. I mean, those are like top three people in top of my mind right now. Um, thank God Jimmy Page is still alive, or else I'd probably be, you know, in an insane asylum right now. I read something earlier that said that the the coronavirus lockdown inspired him to start playing guitar again every day. And it shocked me to hear that Jimmy Page didn't play the guitar every day and hasn't for a long time, but having this time at home made him want to start playing the guitar again. Yeah. I mean, I'm always playing guitar and that's awesome that he's, you know, picked it back up. I mean, he's, you know, he is, he is amazing. I mean, he's legend. Um, uh, fortunately I got to play with him and uh, do like a trio thing with him and Fred Durst from uh, Limp Biscuit in uh, Europe for the uh, European Music Awards. That seems uh, like a very unlikely trio. It was pretty cool. Um, yeah, but, you know, that that actually happened. Um, you know, I didn't care how tired I was. I was like, yeah, I would like to do that, Fred. That would be real fun. So me and Fred went over there and played with Jimmy Page. Do you remember who gave you your first guitar and what kind of guitar it was? My mother... And my father gave me a guitar from Kmart that came in a cardboard box. I don't even know what kind of guitar it was. Um, it had like a whammy bar on it. I mean, it was really like, you know, pretty, pretty rough. But yeah, I mean, I guess if you're going to start learning how to play guitar. You might as well start off on something that doesn't like cost a hundred million bucks, you know? When did you discover that? you could sing. Did you pick up the guitar thinking you were going to be like Eddie Van Halen and, and be a sing uh, and, and be a guitar player? Or did you always well, want to be a front man that uh, played the guitar too? Yeah. What happened was, is I was in a band when um, I was like 13 or 14 years old. It was called high impact. And that we would rehearse in our, in our, you know, drummer and singer's uh, parents' basement. And um, and uh, the the singer, Greg, uh, Greg Dom, he didn't he didn't want to uh, he didn't want to do he didn't want to do singing anymore. He, he uh, found a passion with being artist and painting and stuff. So he just wouldn't come downstairs to practice with us. So my mom had told me like you're never gonna really be able to play like eddie van halen west because he's awesome and you're just learning so why don't you just write write your own songs so i started writing songs when i was about 12 13 years old just because my mom had to like give me the you know the tough like, love the, the tough love that yeah eddie eddie van halen's on a different level so just write your own music <clears throat> she showed me this book and it was a publishing book and said, look, see, the songwriter gets all the money. <laughs> <laughs> Your mom's a very <laughs> smart woman. She's very smart. And um, so I, I took her advice. And, you know, this is where it's this is where it's gotten. 
you know, it's gotten me to. So I'm, I'm thankful for my mom for doing that, actually. And I'm actually a little bit better at doing some kind of like Eddie Van Halen stuff, you know. It's not perfectly, but we all get our musical tastes handed to us by either our parents or our older siblings. And I credit my parents with exposing me to things like, you know, the Beatles and um, Three Dog Night and the Association in Chicago with really, you know, giving me this love of rock music. And then I kind of in the 80s discovered my own genre of rock that I loved. What What did your mom get you listening to? Before you discovered Van Halen, well, we would ba- we were basically just raised on the radio, um, you know, raised on um, on like you know pop like you know movies and stuff, and you know I I just listened I listened to the radio all the time, um, you know, just trying to you know see what the what the deal is, and fortunately, a lot of a lot of songwriting really comes from simplistic. Uh, you know simplicity and um it's really really cool because you know you don't have to like be a shredder to to write write a song you know um you know which is like um like, like nirvana you know like kurt it was kind of like a breath of fresh air because it was just very simple simple songwriting you know with some some passionate and cool uh you know vocals so i just kind of followed like the vibe you know and um and it, it's it's really pretty simple. If anybody's out there listening, um, and you're a songwriter, just just keep writing songs. Get goofy, act a fool. You know, it's, it'll it'll help you break into some different area that you that you probably think somebody else might think is cheesy, but it might be actually really really awesome. You know, it might I might shock them. I mean, ACDC has made an entire career off of playing not simplistic rock and roll, but just straight ahead groove based party music. And it's timeless. Yeah. Tom Petty, I mean, you know, talk, talk about simple. I mean, sometimes, sometimes simple isn't, uh, isn't as um, simple as you think. You know, because I've had a lot of people try out to be in this band and stuff. And, and um, you know, as simple as it may seem, there's a lot of pushes, a lot of pulls, a lot up, like on the up, a lot on the down. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of variation inside of the song, even if it sounds like it's the simplest thing in the world, you know. Do you remember the first song that you wrote? The first song that I wrote was called cruel bitch <laughs> hold on it is all it has long been my theory i was on the radio for 22 years at aaf it was long my theory that rock and roll wouldn't exist if if women weren't bitches and you just proved my theory once again <laughs> i'm telling you you yeah i mean i you know most most of my music would not have have shined had it not been for some just really cruel just you know crazy 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 woman you know so you're welcome for the career that you have you have to look at it that way that all the times you've had your heart broken and every time that you got you know shit on by some woman (laughs) It gave you this career. So in a way, you owe it to them. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to say thank you very much. Um, withholding my son for, uh, you know, 20 whatever years from me uh, was a little bit much. But yeah, OK, I'm going to thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's 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 a working theory I have. It's not perfect. It's just a working theory. I, I believe that you are actually seriously completely totally correct about that yeah we really do owe like most songwriters and you know even women write about men men write about women or men drive women crazy women oh drive trust men. me i mean everybody's driving everybody crazy so i guess we're all just kind of pushing each other to, you know get you know get to a higher level but it's a painful, painful freaking. <laughs> it's, it's painful, man, you know. 
I mean, you you brought up, you know, being a dad and having difficulty with that. Does all does, I know is I paid child support my whole time, and I'm clear. I wasn't a deadbeat dad, you know. I was desperately trying to see him as much as I possibly could, and you know, and I, I you know, he's he's alive and well and doing well, and he's just a he's a darn good looking little man, I must say. Do things like that work themselves out once once your son becomes an adult and can kind of decide on his own what relationships he wants to have? I mean, do you have a relationship with him now? Yes, I do. I but I don't I don't pressure him into, you know, you know, like, you know, having to like feel, you know, feel any guilt or anything like that, you know. I, I just I just want him to know I love him. I'm here for him. If he needs anything, I got his back. And, you know, I'll always be here for him. You know, it ain't just 18 years. I mean, it's you know, it's a lifetime. So I'm happy that um, <clears throat> that he's a grown up, healthy little man. And, and uh, you know, any advice or anything I can help him with educationally or anything, I, I, will, I will do that, um, you know, just because I love him. So. That's about it. You were one of those people that there was a time that going in on the air every day and talking about what was going on in music and in the news. There, I mean, Puddle of Mud was always such a huge band for WAF for years and years and years. And it's always been difficult for me when I see members of bands that are so important, not only to the radio station that I worked at, but just to the Boston and New England area in general, yeah. having a hard time. And it seemed like there was a good long stretch of time where every time I read about you, it was another difficult situation, another interaction with law enforcement. And it it's it's hard for somebody that loves your music and your fans to see from the outside what's going on. What, what was it like from your perspective when all of that stuff was going on in your life, knowing that it was all happening and the whole world knew about it? Yeah, that's a weird transition right there. You know, I, when I first got out here to um, Los Angeles, when Fred Durst, like, you know, signed me and flew me out here, um, you know, they had me in a hotel right on Hollywood Boulevard and, um, just right there by Chinese man theater, um, the tourist central. And I would get up and jog every morning. They put me in a hotel. They gave me an acoustic guitar and they just said, start just write, just write, just write and write. And we're done writing, write more. So I, uh, I did, I did that. I didn't have any friends. And I could go, you know, walk down um, Hollywood Boulevard and there'd be like a line out the door to go into some kind of a private, like some odd party or whatever, like a, a premiere, like, you know, like I went to like Leonardo DiCaprio's like premiere party. And there were all these celebrities and Fred had given me a, 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 a business card for for uh, Flawless Records and Interscope Records. So I would just basically go up to the door guy and just hand him the card and say, yeah, I just got signed by uh, Fred Durst from Limp Biscuit," And he just said, like, if I gave you this card, you, you know, you guys would let me come in and hang out for a minute. And it worked like a charm every time. And um, but yeah, nothing makes no you more legit than a business card. I could get away with a lot of stuff like at that point, you know. And, um, you know, nobody, nobody knew who, who the heck I was, but then all of a sudden, bingo, I could not, <laughs> I couldn't really go anywhere without like, you know, somebody like, you know, I don't know, being a jerk and saying some, you know, crazy stuff or something, trying to get me in trouble or something, you know, so <clears throat> heavy is the head that wears the crown, man. It it seems to come up a lot, you know, once WAF got sold, I mean, a 50-year legacy radio station goes off the air, and there's a massive 
chasm left behind. And since then, doing these interviews on the podcast and really having a chance to have a long conversation with the artists that I always kept in touch with, but in shorter bursts. Or we'd see, you know, bands at shows or, you know, you call into the show for a few minutes. But it's been fascinating for me learning the real stories behind the musicians and the artists that I've always known through the radio station. And one of the, the, the trends that I keep noticing in these interviews is the journeys that artists take when they get sober. And that while everyone's journeys are different, there's always a lot of similarities too. And this industry doesn't make it easy. And a lot of the feedback I get from those interviews are people saying, thank you for asking those questions. And especially because there's so much isolation right now that more and more people are trying to cope with it, unfortunately, and addictions are getting worse. So can you talk about your journey of getting sober and what that was like for you? Yeah, I mean, I've been going to, I've been going to, um, to Alcoholics Anonymous, um, you know, since I was probably about, probably about 12 years old. Um, <clears throat> my dad, like, um, way back, um, had, uh, you know, some, some issues and, um, and then he, uh, he, he got sober and I would take him to AA classes, like, you know, every single day. And I would go to AA with him every single day and I would go, you know, I would, I'd be there for him at any time that he needed me. Um, Sophie, stop it, man. You little weird monkey. Your dog's name is Sophie. Yeah. So, so stop barking. I'm trying to talk to this person on the phone here. Okay. <laughs> so just go over there. Okay. Go over there. She's a good dog. She. What kind of great. dog is she? She's a Los Opso. Aww. Yeah, she's doing all right. We got we got a couple of dogs here, and my best friend and <clears throat> my best friend Hammer, and we are uh, we we are the poster children for uh, isolating of all time. Dogs are really helping with this whole like social they're, they're, distancing, locking yourself in the house. I have a, I have a little black pug named Wednesday and she has been my yeah. best pal. Like, right. She's been awesome. Anyway. So just to get, yeah. So I, I've, I've been going to AA and NA for, uh, you know, I don't know, 35, 40 years. Um, so, you know, it, it, it sinks in, um, you know, and after you see so many other people that are, really in real real bad shape um you know you kind of go yeah i don't really want to be like that you know i don't want to be in that in that area but there's a lot of people that get stuck and you know i guess when you stick a needle in your arm i which i've never ever done um thank god um but yeah it i guess it's somebody told me a long time ago it's like you might as well just take a gun and it's stick it to your head and pull the trigger, you know, but fortunately I didn't have to deal with that kind of an issue, but, uh, yeah, I'm happy to be, to go to the AA meetings and stuff. It's really cool. I mean, they're, the meetings are really, really super cool. And, um, you know, it, it makes you kind of reflect and, you know, be thankful for, you know, wow, I'm not, I wasn't that crazy, you know, cause I've heard some seriously crazy <laughs> crazy stuff man well some of your stories are pretty crazy i i don't know anybody else that got banned from <laughs> graceland that was that was one i had never heard before <laughs> i mean it was like no big deal really I mean, it's a pool you know like you know what's the what's the big trip you know i mean it was beautiful i mean i did a killer jack knife you know i rocked the pool it was amazing i got out i did there's no harm no foul you know and uh yeah i i was almost arrested on the site as well but i just started running so soaking wet running through graceland soaking wet running away from graceland <laughs> before the cops could put me into uh you know their little police car 
You were one of those bands, you know, when you when you do the archaeological dig of rock and roll and where the, the bands come from, it's like Korn gets Fred signed and then Fred signs Stained and Puddle of Mud and it, it just keeps going on. And you talk about being in L.A. and giving door guys your card because that's how Fred told you to get into clubs. And then all of a sudden, you go from being a band and a guy that nobody knows and then Puddle of Mud hits, and that anonymity goes away pretty quickly for you. You know what? <clears throat> Great word. The thing that's kind of a little odd about um, about Alcoholics Anonymous and stuff, <clears throat> the anonymity word um, somehow doesn't like resonate in my brain because it doesn't seem that anonymous to me. And it, you know, because like a um, couple of, like these females that I used to date, like they they uh, went to AA, but it wasn't really too anonymous. You know, there wasn't a lot of anonymity. Um, it was, you know, like um, gratitude checklist at the end of the night with like 70 other different, you know, people online. And I was like, that's not anonymous you know because who knows what you know they're saying to strangers about you know about me or anybody else you know yeah oh it's a little creepy it's still cool but the anonymity factor needs to be like you know way way up you know like please do not lose the anonymous part well, when you grow up seeing what alcohol can do and taking your dad to AA and then you get thrust into LA and all of a sudden you got a song on the radio and do you remember where you were when you first heard Puddle of Mud on the radio? I was in Kansas City in uh, 1994 and they were playing a song called You Don't Know off of the first ep by puddle of mud called stuck and uh kq um 98.9 the rock would play uh they would play our song like just out of the kindness of their hearts and we're kind of like right up there with like you know stp and pearl jam and sound garden and then um once the big the big wigs uh caught on they you know kind of smeared us off the off the charts but we were there then and um i was uh i think i was in my old bass player's van it was plumbing van and um and um we were on the way to go do this plumbing job at a trailer park in like 15 below zero and we we're doing a main line the grossest thing i've ever experienced in my life believe me he snaked out like a 200 yard freaking snake or whatever and pulled back and the things that came out of that freaking pipe were just crazy but yeah yes um you don't know was played um on the radio at that point and then the other you know the other time was when uh, control uh the smack my ass song <clears throat> i was going down um i was going down like some road in um uh, in, in like the sunset strip or something and it just popped on like um, on um, what the heck is that radio station? Um, the biggest one. Oh, in- K Rock. K Rock. So K Rock. Yeah, I was on K Rock. I had no clue, but blam! All of a sudden, Control came on K Rock, and um, I was um, dating this really, really awesome chick. She's super cool, actually. And, Didn't write um, any music about her at all. Uh, I wrote "Spin You Around" about her. Oh, okay. Yeah yeah she was she was dancing like naked in front of me when i wrote that song so i thought yeah whatever so that's how that went down (laughs) but yeah i was going down sunset strip and it just came on cranked it opened up the sunroof you know and she was like just you know cheersing and you know doing the you know doing the wave and stuff outside the little the little you know little thing that goes back whatever that's called the roof, the sunroof. Oh, the sunroof, like, yeah. Yeah. Like, yay! So that was a good that was a good moment right there, too. But once that song hit and you're driving down the sunset strip with 
the hot girl that likes to dance naked. Everybody else discovered Puddle of Mud pretty much at the same time. And all of a sudden, you weren't just this awesome band from Kansas City getting played on your local radio station. You're this huge band now and all of the pressures that come with that. I mean, it seemed for some like it was an overnight thing, but you guys had been a band for a while trying to make it. Yeah, for a long, long time. Uh, it was really actually it was crazy the way it happened. I mean, you know, fake backstage pass, you know, um, demo tape. I'm talking a cassette tape with like 30 songs on it and a phone number. And, you know, a couple of weeks later, I get a page on a little one of them little pagers way back in the day and uh, called that back. And my friend said that Fred Durst had called and bingo. Was like, you got to go to the New Orleans airport and you got to get to uh, Los Angeles immediately. So you guys made fake backstage passes. Yeah. This guy that I was kind of jamming around with, um, his name was Baron. And um, yeah, he had made fake, fake backstage passes. And um, he said, Hey man, did you bring a demo tape with you? Cause I'm talking Fred Durst security guard down in the, you know, down in the black backstage deal. And I was like, yep, yeah, actually somehow magically I just have one. You know, it was made by a, a fan named Leeshan. She's a really amazing, amazing fan, amazing friend of mine. Um, and um, yeah, she she sent me two uh, tapes, one for me and one for my mother, because I had ran out of uh, I ran out of CDs because I'd given them all away, you know. And I was basically done doing it. I was I, uh, at that point. I was like, I'm I'm not gonna do this anymore. I'm gonna go and you know bartend in New Orleans and. And, um, you know, um, be a responsible father and pay my child support and, you know, be there for for my son or, you know, as, as much as I can, as much as I, you know, that, that's how it went. And so from bending the rules and making an illegal backstage pass, thus begins the career of Puddle of Mud. But from the very beginning, breaking rules. Well, I didn't make the backstage passes that were fake. Um, that, that was barren. But I did. Well, I I was like, sure, I'll go try it. But we just walked right on by, man. Like the security, you know. We went back there, and I gave uh, Fred security guard the the demo tape, and I went back up to the to, the, to where the seats were we were at, and and then uh, me and my bro, uh, Big Dave, we left, and we left it because they weren't serving any beer there. Um, so we had to leave, but you know, there was like, we got to see like corn play and biscuit play and we got to see ice cube play, got to see filter play. Um, really cool. show, great show. And, um, you know, it was a pretty magical time. It is kind of amazing that your career launched because you gave the demo to the security guard and he didn't just throw it out, which happens a lot. I told him to have fun throwing it away. <laughs> I did. I was like, "Have fun throwing this away, man. I'm, I'm out, man. I'm done doing this." And it seems like such a foreign concept to anybody that's in their 20s that that would be how things used to get done. That you had a cassette with your phone number on it, and you gave it to a guy. And I mean, that's how Godsmack got signed here in Boston was because they gave their demo to one of our DJs at WAF and he listened to it and liked it and started playing it just like you guys were getting played on the radio in Kansas City. Right. You guys are great. I thank you very, very much. All you, Everybody in the radio world, you know, just you guys, my hat's off to you guys and I, I can't thank you guys enough. Seriously. It, it's so hard now because radio is changing so much. And, you know, when you lose a radio station like WAF, that was such a huge trend-setting rock station, and for it to go off the air after 50 years and leave this void in the Northeast where a new band can't go. I mean, that's what I'm trying to do with the podcast and, and everything that I'm doing is is still trying to have that outlet for people to discover new music and to keep in touch with the bands that they already know they love. And, you know, every episode of the the podcast, I make a playlist 
and all the music yeah. that we talk about, I always put in a playlist that's linked to the episode so that people can go and, and it helps them discover new music or maybe songs that they didn't know about before that they hear us talking about. But it's getting harder for bands to have the story that Puddle of Mud has. Yeah, and Godsmack, yeah. I, 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 I thought I heard something about that story, but I didn't know that it was y'all. So... That's really cool that you guys like like hooked them up because yeah I mean shoot man that's one of my favorite tours I've ever been on one of the first big tours I ever I was ever on was with Godsmack and the Deftones and Puddle of Mud and that's a hell that of a just, lineup. It was a great concert, man. That was amazing. The uh, the favors always <laughs> they they always get returned. Like Sully and I, Sully and I are still very good friends. And when I launched my company and launched my podcast. He actually wrote my theme song for me. And that's what the intro to my podcast is, is a song that Sully wrote for me to use as my show intro. So it's pretty cool. That's really cool. And he stayed yeah, that, local. That's awesome. I mean, that, yeah, I mean, those, those guys are just, they're awesome. I mean, just, they're just awesome. I love them. I love those cats. Did you end up moving to California, or where, where do you live now? Did you move well, home? I mean, I have like a well, you know, I I should have never got married. Just to say, I'll just I'll just say that <laughs> you and me both, honey. I have no business being married to anybody. Believe me, and I understand that. I should have never went against my own rule, but I did. I just got remarried, and I think I got it right the second time. But I think the first time, abysmal failure. So I I totally get it. Yeah. So uh, the, the, yeah. Well, you know, I like I I definitely like LA a lot. Um, I really do. It's the weather's just freaking impeccable out here. Um, but I do miss I do miss the snow. I miss Kansas City. You know, a lot. Um, I wish I actually. If, you know, this pandemic thing would just go away, I could just fly home and, like, give my mother and my sister and my dad and my, my brothers and cousins and stuff. And we could all have, like, a family reunion and not have to worry about nothing. And, um, I I think that there is uh, light on the horizon. And there's, you know, it seems like there's some light at the end of the tunnel at this point. Um, well, according to Live Nation, they're expecting concerts to come back to the outdoor amphitheaters next summer, according to an article I read this week. Well, awesome. Good. So we'll see. We shall see. But I hope that happens, you know. But you ended up going out to L.A. and never going back home. I was just curious if you if you went back to Kansas City. I, uh, yeah, of course I do. I, I, I go back whenever when I can. Um, but yeah, it's like I, you know, when you get slapped on a, you know, a bunch of tours for, um, shoot, 15, 20 years, um, you know, there is no real home except for wherever you lay your head. You know, sometimes it might be a bunk on the tour bus. Sometimes it might be a hotel room. You know, sometimes it might just be sitting in a, you know, a car, or, you know, a seat in a car, you know, just sleeping, sitting straight up. But, yeah, it's like I, I really haven't really lived anywhere, lived anywhere um, until this whole um, pandemic thing happened. So I've kind of lived here for like the last eight months in um, complete isolation, really. What have you started doing besides playing with the dogs and playing guitar every day? What have you started doing? Have you learned a new skill or discovered a new hobby that you just didn't know that you wanted to have until you got locked in the house because of the COVID? Um, well, I'm just, you know, like you said, like Jimmy Page picked his guitar up again and started like writing. I mean, I, I basically did the same exact same thing he did. I'm just like, yeah, man, like, you know, cool i can actually sit down chill and write you know heck i should probably give him a call man i'd write a song with him tell him i said hi <laughs> yeah i'm gonna try and see if i can do that do some kind of like yeah do a little co-jam with jimmy page that'd be cool yeah 
That's a hell of a way to spend some time while you're locked in isolation during a global pandemic. Yeah. Like, hey, man, you're isolated. I'm isolated. Let's write a song together, man. But have you been, have you discovered a love of cooking or I know, like I read that Keith Richards has been gardening. I mean, just kind of random things. (laughs) I wonder what he's gardening. (laughs) It is Keith Richards. So who knows? It could be a lot of stuff. Yeah. Just, yeah, I've just been trying to just lay low, you know, um, you know, just, Fly low, lay low, stay low, be cool, be chill, you know, don't get into no trouble. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm happy just to be actually a songwriter, being able to write songs whenever I freaking want to do it, you know? Yeah, it's it's been a very strange thing, and it's it's been very individual for people on how they're managing this time. Like, for me... I was always, I think anybody in the entertainment business, you know, you're on the go, like you said, living out of a tour bus, just go, 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 go. And what's weird for me is that the radio station got sold a few weeks before the the lockdowns really started. So I've had to, in this downtime since March, start a company, build a studio, you know, get all my own graphics done, build my own website, launch the podcast, like, because I don't have a normal to go back to when the world opens back up again, because that got taken away at the end of February when AAF went off the air. Wow. So it's like, I I don't know what the world is going to be like when we can all leave the house again, because the radio station that I spent 29 years at doesn't exist anymore. That is insane. Yeah, it's been really weird. It's it's but been good. Hey, you know I'm clapping for you. I mean, way to go, girl. Way oh, to go. Thank you. It just nope. it's what I love to do. You know, it's like I love music, but I don't have any musical ability. But I love, I love the community, and I love you know going to shows, and I just love the lifestyle of it, and I love talking to people. And now yeah. to have a new way of doing it and for it to be all of my own control, which is really weird, not to quote a song title for you, but like when you're in when you're in control of your own destiny for the first time in your life, it's kind of I mean, it's scary as fuck, but it's also really exciting. Yeah, I'm super proud of you. Um, wow. Perseverance, girl. You got it. But it's been it's been it's been interesting, you know, to go back to the nerdy stuff. Like I've had to learn how to build a website and how to be my own IT person. These were all things that before the pandemic, I had no idea what the hell I was talking about. You know what? Nerds are cool. Yeah. And we all owe everything to them. So I'm a geek. You're a geek. We're nerds, you know, but we're, we're, uh, we're the sexiest nerds in the world. (laughs) I will take that as a compliment. Thank you. You got it. So talk to me about what was supposed to be 2020 for Puddle of Mud. I mean, you release the record la- the, towards like fourth quarter of last year and Welcome to Galvania comes out in what, September? And so, uh, yep. and so your plan was to basically spend all of 2020 out on the road. Pretty much, yeah. Yep. What's the last show that you guys played? Uh, the last thing I think I did was, um, I was in Universal Studios in, uh, Orlando and, um, I got to play with like some of my, some of my heroes, like Ario Speedwagon and Run DMC. He was there. Um, Daryl McDaniels is one of the nicest, most genuine people on the planet. Am I wrong? Uh, amazing. And that, I think that that. It was his other, the other guy. It wasn't Run. It was the other rapper guy. So, and then there, Rev Run a, or or Daryl or DMC. And it wasn't Run. It, Run wasn't there. Oh, it was, okay. It was Daryl. Yes, it's Daryl. Yeah. Just such yeah. a sweet, genuine guy. Yeah, and um, yeah, he had a great set. You know, he explained how uh, you know they had. 
written these songs. It, I think it, I, I forgot what the thing of the show was, but it was a uh, you know Scott Stapp from Creed was there. He did some he did some songs. Um, there was a lot of really really amazing musicians that you know I probably grew up listening to like all of their music, but I just didn't know what they looked like. So because I was such a broke, poor little person growing up. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't really, I couldn't buy records, even see anybody's pictures, you know. I still don't even know what Pink Floyd looked like today. I thought it was actually a pink person when I was growing up. But, um, yeah, there was a bunch of really, really amazing, like, you know, artists and writers and stuff that were there. And then it was like the backup band, you know. And um, they did a great job. And, um you know that was fun. that was fun to do. That was really fun. And then everything just gets canceled. And you know, I I saw the message that you guys put up on your website. You know, to your fans being so devastated that you had to cancel the tour. Yeah, yeah. Fly home. You know, they're already they were already separating people in the planes. They were already like not allowing it. I'm surprised I even got back got back to Los Angeles. Um, but yeah it was a little creepy and um that's the last uh i think that's the last one there might have been one other one but i think that might have been the last one i joke yeah. all the time that if i had known watching bush in vegas at the end of february if that was going to be the last concert i saw for the year like I would have sang a little more. I would have ordered like one more beer at the bar. Like I feel like I squandered the opportunity because I didn't know that I wouldn't be allowed to go to concerts for the rest of the year. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I was my my management team um was talking about uh, a Bush Puddle of Mud tour. Actually just like a couple days ago that I've been told that. Well, that would be great. I think that would be fun. Yeah. I mean, they were unbelievable in February in Vegas. They were great. Gavin still sounds great. You know, Chris cool. is an unbelievable guitar player. The show was awesome. Right. Yeah. So that, yeah, my team was like, yeah, man, you want to go on tour with Bush? And I was like, uh, yeah, sure. Let's do that. That sounds fun. Now it's just a matter of the global pandemic. Yeah, but you know, I just I I believe and I pray and you know I'm pretty good friends with God and um, yeah I was talking to him the other day and he said forget about it it's gonna be all right you know I got this you know so it's gonna be okay. Is that spirituality something that you've discovered later in life or did you always grow up that way? You know I've always just believed in in a, in in one God you know. Just, that's the way I roll, you know. I'm just like, God is God. I'm not sure about all these other stories, but you know, you know, I I pray to God. That's that's who I pray to. And a lot of people that that overcome a lot of the stuff that you've overcome, and and obviously you talking about what it was like with your dad when you were a kid. People talk about how helpful that spirituality is, and that belief of something else in that journey of sobriety. Yeah, you know what? My my uh, my pastor, life coach, really great friend, um, Randall Smalls, had there is a percentage thing to where it says with um, you know God on your side and uh, you know like a higher power, uh, the rate of um, success for um, sobriety and clarity is is like like 85 percent and without uh spiritual you know spirituality um it's like 10 or 15 percent wow you know, yeah so if you if you got god on your team you are going to be healed way quicker as if you would not have um any spirituality wow that's a crazy statistic yeah because I've never cool. been anybody that, like, it's never been a huge part of my life, but I know so many people are so passionate about it and are so helped by it. 
I don't maybe, yeah, I mean, maybe I haven't found the right one. I don't know. Yeah, I just, you know, do some Our Fathers, you know. And, um, I don't know. See, I, like a, I, I actually do an Our Father, and then I dance, and I, like, start dancing in the middle of the freaking living room. And then I have this gong here, and I go, I love you. <laughs> God. <laughs> I think that's and the first I- gong on the Mistress Carrie podcast. And then I like dance back to my little couch (laughs) and I I say, amen. (laughs) I do that every day. Well, I think anything that involves a gong is instantly better. Oh, of course. Yeah. He he is real. Believe me. No, I mean a a gong, not, not God. The gong. The gong. If you, you add, you add a gong to anything and it's instantly better. Oh, it's really a gong. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you, is it harder for a band to get to the level that Puddle of Mud got to, or is it harder for a band to stay there? What's harder? Sheesh, man. Oh, I mean, it's, that's, you know, a double-edged sword. You, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to get, to get, you know, to get this, uh, it's very difficult. Um, and, um, to stay, you just got to keep writing, you know, just don't like, uh, you know, don't hedge all your bets on, uh, just, you know, one jam, you know, try to break through with more, you know? So I, you know, fortunately I can say that I'm not a one hit wonder, which is kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, you definitely have a track record of successful songwriting, and but I, I would think that the pressure mounts. The more success you get, the harder it feels to to maintain it. Yeah, a lot of a lot of record like you know executives. I mean, throughout these years, you know, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, it's like I didn't really want to hear them say it, but they always say it, and they say, "Keep writing." Keep writing, keep writing, keep writing, keep writing. It's like, it, it's like, yeah, that was good. That was great. That's awesome. Keep writing. How do you stay motivated to keep, like, like I told you, like, I don't have musical ability. I, I've never had the ability to write songs or to play an instrument. And I've tried. And I know what a personal thing it is that you pour your emotions and your and your life experience into this song and and you deliver it to those executives and you think it's perfect and they say keep writing what does that feel like you know it's a challenge you know it's very challenging and um i'm up for a challenge and shoot man you know i had that not been said you know over the course of my life um you know, I might have just been like, you know, happy with just one big hit, you know, but um, I was like, you know, I was like, okay, okay, cool. I'll keep writing. I'll keep writing. You know, I really enjoy writing anyway to begin with. So, you know, it's what I've been doing for a while and I love it. And um, so it's kind of like, yeah, here, go keep going, man. Keep going. Keep going. You know, I don't know. It's kind of like a coach or something. You know, I'm telling you, you can do better and you can, you know, you can play better you know so you know it's it's cool it's totally it's totally cool um you know there's pushing you people you know people that push you um kind of help you you know i mean there's a difference between writing a song about your hot naked dancing girlfriend and Ah. (laughs) and writing a song like you have on your latest record that you wrote about your cousin and a very personal inspiration that that comes there is there a fear to take a song like that and let someone hear it and then be afraid that they're not going to like it because i would be afraid to pour everything something so personal into it and to and to have it not be well received 
uh you know it's it's really it's it's there's no like there's no fear or nothing you know it's just a challenge um you know there's nobody trying to like you know stick a knife to your head or something um so you know the uh you know it's encouragement at the same time it's con constructive criticism it's encouragement it's like that's really awesome keep doing that you know it's like a it's like a really great coach you know do you mind talking about that, about Go to Hell? Do you mind talking about the inspiration for that song? Um, well, I was in, um, <clears throat> I was in um, Malibu, California, and uh, my, my old personal assistant, Jose, he, um, I was going through a little breakup, and I was a little heartbroken. So I went to uh, Malibu, and uh, John Denver's uh, widow, she let me, um stay in in the studio in john denver's studio so for free and um shoot she'd cook me dinner and everything every night it was amazing and um and uh, i just sat there and wrote songs and i wrote going to hell there and um yeah i wrote going to hell in john denver's uh studio in malibu california and um yeah i mean i don't know it was just a vibe and you know I just kind of, I just kind of chewed on the, on the vibe and, and that song came out and it's pretty, I like, really love that song actually. It's pretty, pretty badass. And you wrote it for your cousin that, you know, you, you talk about this personal inspiration. I mean, we, we joke about, you know, the inspiration of women being bitches, but then you take something, you know, that, that means so much and, and losing a cousin that you love and, and you pour that into that song is it does does that make it harder to play the song live not that you've had the opportunity to this year but to relive that do you do you have to go back to that place that you were at to write it in order to be able to perform it well the thing about singing um i, I don't know what the deal is but when you're um like if you start crying um your voice really like like I don't know what happens, but your voice just goes into the, into the burner. And, um, so the less, the less you cry, like the better you're going to sing. But if you're sitting there bawling your brains out, you're not going to be singing great. In my, in my case, I'm not sure about other singers, but yeah. And, and, and you know, I dearly, dearly miss him. Um, I know I'll see him in heaven. And, um, you know, he's with me all the time and, uh, yeah, it was, a, it, it, it sucks, but you know, um, you know, I, 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 mean, I think I've written two songs about him at this point, you know, the other one was called better place. <clears throat> yeah. So it's good, man. You know, it's, it's, it's okay. You know, I love, I love him forever and I'll see him. I'll see him later. It's something when you're when you're looking at the careers of artists that you lose, you know, somebody like a Chester Bennington or a Chris Cornell or are obvious yeah. recent examples. <clears throat> some people get some people are so shocked at the loss, but the conversations that I've had with people, it's like when you look back at the lyrical content of those songs, everything that they were feeling was all spelled out right there. And we were kind of on the receiving end of it as a form of entertainment, which is kind of weird in a way. Yeah. You know? it, when you yeah. really think about it, it's a very weird thing that someone's pain and their anguish and all of these things get turned into this amazing art form, this, um, this beautiful music that we then consume, but, but we're really consuming people's hardest times and their demons basically and it, it's all there and it's yeah and it's like right in front of you it's like he, they're talking about it like blatantly you know is it cathartic is it part of the healing process to be able to write about difficult things because yeah, for it sure. Because it feels weird when you really sit down and think about it from my perspective that it's like, oh, I really love that song. Oh, well, it's about this horrible, tragic, terrible moment in my life. And I'm, and, and then it's like, oh, well, I love that song, but I, I feel really bad that you had to go through that shit to write it. Yeah. 
They 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 ran into the wrong women, obviously. Well, <laughs> obvi- obviously, you all have. Yeah, we yeah yeah, and you've ran into the wrong men or women. Yeah, with men, but yeah, either way. Yeah. yeah, it's vice versa. I just don't have any awesome songs to show for it. I'm sure you could probably come up with a few. <laughs> So what is the what is the plan for Puddle of Mud moving forward? I mean, you have not been able to tour with the record. And so are you guys going to go out on the road as soon as you can? Or, do you, or are you going to start trying to turn all of this writing that you've been doing in your downtime into a new was, record and doing that? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I was in the studio last night for like three or four hours. Fortunately, it was only, it was like right down the street. I mean, it's like a block and a half away from here, which is amazing. And yeah, the artists that have performed and did their thing in that studio, it's just freaking wall full of just like platinum records. It was amazing. And I was like, oh, okay, this is a block and a half away. Okay, I'm just going to, I'm just going to record here for a while. You know, it's so close. You know, I can walk there. For me, for years, I went to a radio station, right, to go to, to go to work, and I went into that studio, and that's what I did, and the studio was awesome. For me, now I built my own studio. I call it MCHQ, and I have my own studio, and I can make it look the way I want, and it sounds great. Can you talk to me about the importance of the vibe of a studio and some of the places that you've recorded that helped create the the sound of the music that we've heard like how important is that location because i the music wouldn't sound the same if you just had a studio at home and just decided to do it that way right does it affect it it's it's brilliant to work with a um an amazing amazing producer and an amazing engineer slash really like a really amazing song guy like a song girl whatever whoever um it's just yeah it's it's lovely to work with with other people that are super brilliant and uh super amazingly talented you know which i've i've got i've had the cream of the crop for a long long time you know so i'm I'm blessed with that before I let you go, one of the one of the questions that I always try to ask everybody is, you know, the, musicians are some of the most well-traveled people I, I know, and rock fans are willing to go pretty much anywhere to follow their favorite bands around. So if someone is listening to this that's never been to Kansas City where you grew up, and they go there, talk about the, the food or the cool places to hang out. Where would you send people to your hometown that have never been there before? Well, you know, I love Kansas City Masterpiece uh, Barbecue. Um, and that's my favorite barbecue spot. It's in the, the plaza downtown. It's really cool. There's like a little cool little river. Um you know, maybe check out a, you know, Chiefs, Kansas City Chiefs. If you can go by Arrowhead Stadium and check out a football game or a baseball game with the Royals. Um, you know, <clears throat> I mean, there's a lot of other barbecue spots too. What What is it about Kansas City barbecue? Because, it, I mean, it's obviously famous for it, but what makes it so good? Maybe love and hope, um, <laughs> you know, uh, it's like uh, there's a lot of barbecue spots. I mean, Rosedale barbecue is pretty darn good, too. Um, Arthur Bryant's, I think every president has gone by there. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's just it's just the vibe and, you know, it's KC and, you know, it's a, an incredible town. I love it. Shoot, man. Um, I wish I was there right now, actually. Um, but yeah, for, for Kansas city, just, you know, enjoy yourself, eat some good food, you know, relax, chill, kick back and, you know, no harm, no foul, you know, everybody's going to be all right. Do you have any memories of being in Boston 
food memories, venue memories, show memories that, that you want to talk about? Uh, in Boston, um, yeah, I think we played like across the street from Fenway. Yeah, right? Lansdowne Street is where all the clubs are, yeah. Yeah, there's like a House of Blues or a something right over there across the road. Yep. Yeah. Um, Did you get to yeah. go inside Fenway? <clears throat> um, I Is that where the green wall is? Yeah, the monster, yeah. The green wall, yeah, okay, yeah, that was a really, really cool, yeah, that was cool. We got to sit right there on the green wall. And, um, yeah, that was pretty freaking rad, man. That's crazy. That's a big wall. I mean, how the hell are you supposed to freaking hit a baseball over that thing, man, really? Well, that's, um, I mean, that was that was the intimidation factor of, of putting no, that, it there, you know? That should be illegal, in my opinion. I was like, what? It's like 900 feet tall, man. How the hell are you supposed to hit a ball over that thing? Hey, Big Poppy never had a problem hitting over that wall. Okay, well, I'm just saying, like, <laughs> me, any little white butt, like, yeah, I'll I'll try to. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's yeah. I'd have to train for that, but um. Anyway, yeah, that was fun when we got to play. Uh, that I think it was a House of Blues or what? A, what um, hard Rock, maybe I don't know. Yeah, it's the House I, of I, Blues. I mean, it, it, there have been those clubs have changed names a bunch of times, but when the House of Blues yeah. went in there, they really built a nice sounding room. I mean, that that room is really nice. Well, I was sitting in the bar. You know, getting a cocktail, and my uh, old guitar player Paul Phillips had come up to me, and he was uh, he was hanging out with the singer for Shinedown. God bless those guys; they're great. Oh, amazing and, guys! Amazing. Yeah, they rock. And uh, Paul started peeing on my foot, uh, and uh, so you know, being the road dogs that we are, you know, I didn't really even bat an eye, but the bartender is like. Uh, you know that guy's pissing on your foot, Wes. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, it's okay. He's my guitar player. It's cool. Don't worry about it. You know, you know. <laughs> is that the only time a guitar player peed on your foot, or is or, or is that the memory of Boston you have? Because it only happened the one time. Oh no, no, no! <laughs> You're asking me for a crazy story, so I just yeah, it it it, it, it was it you know nobody got like really hurt or anything, you know. It was just, I got, my, my foot was peed on, but it's okay. I, I love that it happened in my hometown. It's okay. <laughs> we all, all got kicked out and, you know, and there was some name things going around and I was kind of like, we got to get the heck out of here, dude. Like you are insane. Please lay off the kettle one. Well, getting banned in Boston is something that, you know, there's a certain badge of honor. Ask Fred Durst. He knows. I bet. Okay, he might have me be. <laughs> that was back when they did that that concert. They they just showed up on the rooftop of an auto body place right around the corner, um, around the corner from Fenway, and cool. like and they they told us where the location was and we gave it out on the radio. And within ten minutes, five thousand people were just running down the street watching. Limp Biscuit on the rooftop of a building, and they got kicked out of Boston for like ten years, I think, because of that. That is freaking awesome! Oh, it was hilarious. It's the first time I was ever interviewed on MTV. It was because I was there. It was hilarious. Thank you for that info. All right, you're making me feel like a little bit better these days. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good day. That was a lot of fun. Well, you, you throw some people from Jacksonville in the mix and, you know, you never know what's going to fly, you know? You yeah. Know people from Jacksonville down. are their own breed. I know, man. They're little surfer people, man. They, yeah, don't get in their, don't get on their wave. I mean, <laughs> they will bash you and, until you're beat, you know, blue in the head. Well, Wes, I am so grateful for your time. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Well, thank you too. Thank you very, very much. I uh, I look forward to getting you guys back out on the road, and you know I look forward to hearing that collaboration with Jimmy Page. I let me know if that's going to happen. I'm interested. I'm actually seriously going to pursue that. Actually, well, if it ever comes to fruition, the idea came on my show, so you have to call me back and tell me that it's happening. I want to hear the song first. Okay, all right, I will. Deal. Done. Deal. Thanks, Wes. Have a great day. Stay healthy, obviously, and hopefully, you know, we'll see Puddle of Mud on the road next summer when these amphitheaters open back up. 
Uh, right on, girl. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Sweet. Bye-bye. There he is, the one and only Wes Scantlin from Puddle of Mud, or I, I, I'm supposed to call him Dork. So Dork from Puddle of Mud. In the show notes of this podcast, there is the corresponding playlist with all the music that we talked about, and there's also a link to the lyric video for the song that we talked about called Go to Hell, which is off of their latest album, Welcome to Galvania, that came out in September. I want to thank Digital Federal Credit Union at dcu.org for sponsoring this week's podcast, and also mistresscarry.com, where you can go and get all the podcast episodes, all the episodes of Cocktails in the War Room, and do some shopping in the Mistress Carry online store. Plus, all the links to my social media accounts and all the links to Puddle of Mud's accounts are there as well. Don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss anything. New full-length episodes of the Mistress Carrie podcast come out every Wednesday, and every Monday through Friday, you get a situation report, which is all of your music news, rock headlines, and industry info in less than five minutes. And you can always join me every Tuesday night live at 8.30 on my Facebook page for Cocktails in the War Room.